This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Why not check out their series, Apocalypse World War One? It's a great fit. You're watching the War Graphics channel. After all, drawing from over 300 hours of archival footage, Apocalypse World War I traces the journeys of civilians and soldiers who fought for survival in one of the darkest times in history. Examine an era that fundamentally changed the worldwide balance of power from the war's outbreak in 1914 through its duration to the US intervention and the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. Curiosity streams available on many platforms. If you've got a smart device, you're going to be able to watch it, and it's also available worldwide. Go to curiositystream.com forward slash war graphics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And right now, you guys can use the promo code WARAGRAPHICS to get 25% off the cost of an annual subscription, which makes it just $14.99 a year. And as I often say, that is cheaper than some streaming services that I pay every month. So it's a great deal. So again, go to curiositystream.com forward slash WARAGRAPHICS to get 25% off, making it $14.99 for the whole year. And now today's video. In 1917, Finland finally declared itself an independent nation. For over a century, the country had been part of the Russian Empire, but the messy Russian Revolution had weakened the empire's grip on the region. Following the declaration, the Soviet Union begrudgingly recognized Finland as a sovereign nation, but no official peace treaty had been signed. So for the next couple of years, the countries took punches at each other in an attempt to gain land or political support of some conflicted areas. This included the Russian involvement in the Finnish Civil War, Finnish militias attempting to annex portions of North Northwest Russia, and even an assassination attempt of a Finnish commander. Even after a treaty in 1920 officially confirming the new borders, the chaotic political makeup of the region continued to cause unrest and distrust between the two nations. Finally, in 1932, the two countries signed a non aggression pact as both of them had joined the League of Nations, a precursor to the UN. But this period of peace didn't last very long. At the beginning of the Second World War, the Soviet Union saw its opportunity to reclaim some of Finland for the motherland. What was initially expected to be a smooth takeover quickly turned into a fierce Finnish defense of their home in the brutal winter of 1939. Today we're going to dive into how Finland was able to put up such a fight against the much larger Soviet army, the consequences of the war, and a man who is absolutely one of the biggest badasses of the 20th century. In 1939, the Soviet Union was growing more and more anxious to gain some parts of Finnish territory because the Finnish border was quite close to the city of Leningrad, today known as St. Petersburg. Stalin was concerned that a Nazi occupation of Finland would give the German army the perfect place from which to launch its troops into one of Russia's most populated cities. In October 1939, Soviet diplomats were hoping to create this buffer zone around Leningrad. So, like a toddler wanting a toy, they requested that Finland hand over the Karelian Isthmus, give up all their islands in the Gulf of Finland, all their islands in the Rabatri Peninsula, and destroy all military fortifications in these areas before evacuating them. Additionally, the Soviets would borrow the Hanko Peninsula for 30 years and set up their own military base there. In return, Russia would give Finland two small pieces of territory from its northern border with some villages, so not exactly what you would call a very fair trade. After discussion with the Finnish parliament, Finland's diplomats in Moscow promptly told the Soviet Union they could shove this offer where the sun does not shine, and gave two counteroffers which were much more reasonable for both sides and included much less land being traded. But Russia, as always, was unable to compromise and sent the Finnish diplomats home under the impression that negotiations would continue at a later date. But little did those diplomats know at the time that that was the end of Stalin's attempts to negotiate. On the 26th of November, near a small Soviet village called Manila, a Russian border guard station suddenly came under artillery fire, supposedly resulting in the death of four guards and the injuries of nine others. The reason we say supposedly is because according to later reports, there was actually no artillery in the area, Finnish or Russian. This was actually a false flag operation, a faked incident to give the Soviet Union justification to break its non-aggression pact with Finland as soon as possible. Not to mention the fact that Soviets have been training for over a year in the area, conducting war games in which this exact village was attacked, sparking a war between the nations. So, 
obviously not suspicious at all. Following the attack, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov immediately accused Finland of attacking their border and demanded that the Finnish border be moved back over 30 kilometers. Finland asserted their innocence and offered to cooperate in investigating the incident, even going so far as to suggest a joint investigation team with members from each country. But, well, you don't want Finland investigating the incident you made up, so the Soviet Union announced that the Finnish response had been hostile and immediately withdrawing from the non-aggression pact on November 28, 1939 and preparing for war. On November 30, 1939, just two days after withdrawing from the non-aggression pact, Soviet planes bombed Helsinki, the capital of Finland. These initial bombings of Helsinki were immediately met with international criticism. For example, US President Franklin D. Roosevelt criticized the Soviets for bombing Finnish cities, and Foreign Minister Molotov responded that Soviet aircraft had not been bombing cities, but airfields, and you couldn't see that from 8,000 kilometers away in America. Molotov later announced on Russian radio that Soviet planes weren't dropping in bombs on Helsinki, but actually humanitarian aid and food to the poor, starving Finnish citizens. Finland started calling these bombs Molotov bread baskets as a stab at the man lying to his population. While planes were making bombing runs on Helsinki, 250,000 Soviet troops marched across the border, and after fighting through a small resistance force, they attacked the coasts, forests, and the main line of Finnish defense, the Mannerheim Line. Over 130,000 Finnish soldiers were stationed at the line to resist the Soviet invasion with trenches, logs, and concrete fortifications for cover. The Soviets, who had expected to steamroll the smaller country in just a few weeks, were in for a little bit of a surprise. After 40 hours of deafening Soviet artillery, thousands of Red Army soldiers rushed the Finnish defenses at Tapale, but were gunned down before reaching the defenses. The Finns, with their home court advantage, also had the high ground and had been preparing the line for quite some time. For nearly a week, the Soviets continued to to throw soldiers of the Mannerheim line, but they were met with heavy casualties each and every time. The Soviets were confident that their hundreds of tanks would overcome these defenses, though. Finnish troops had almost no modern anti-tank equipment, but they were prepared in their own way. The most famous improvised weapons against tanks was a bottle or jar filled with a flammable substance with a rag in the neck of the bottle as a fuse. These quickly became known as Molotov cocktails, a drink to wash down Molotov's bread baskets from earlier. Along with Molotov cocktails, Finnish soldiers would commonly jam logs or metal rods into the wheels of Soviet tanks, leaving them immobile and an easy target for a few cocktails. This was especially easy easy, because the Soviet strategy at this point was to thrust the tanks forward into enemy lines, as the Red Army had been inspired by Germany's blitzkrieg tactics in Western Europe. The Finns delivered devastating losses to the Soviet forces throughout these first weeks. One attack, for example, only lasted a single hour, but resulted in hundreds of Soviet casualties and 27 tanks destroyed, and on the 12th of November, two Soviet rifle divisions were eliminated by comparatively small forces, regarded as the first major Finnish victory of the war. A few days later, near the city of Vyborg, 20 Soviet tanks managed to break a hole in the Finnish defenses and moved behind their lines. But their supporting troops were all repelled, and the tanks were left stranded in enemy territory until they were destroyed one by one. Overall, the Mannerheim line held, and the Soviets had been defeated. As Soviet forces advanced into the snow-covered forests of central Finland, they were met with fierce guerrilla tactics and a brutal northern winter. Taking full advantage of fighting in their backyard, Finnish soldiers used skis to quickly navigate through the heavy snow, and many wore white cloaks to blend in with the landscape, making them nearly invisible until it was too late. The Soviets, on the other hand, were as visible as ever, as for the first month of the war, they were still in their standard khaki uniforms, marching next to green and brown tanks. So Finnish troops would ski silently through the forest, surrounding Soviet columns and breaking their cover at once to attack from all sides. The weather was also on Finland's side. The temperature dipped at one point to minus 43 Celsius or minus 45 Fahrenheit, and Finland servicemen had all brought their own trusty winter coats to the fight, while many Soviet soldiers were lacking proper gear, especially adequate gloves. As many as 10% of all Soviet soldiers had frostbite on their body before even reaching the Finnish border, and at the Battle of Suomessani, thousands of Soviet soldiers just froze to death. Soviet morale was at an all-time low across the whole front, as historian William Trotter stated, The Soviet soldier had no choice. If he refused to fight, he would be shot. If he tried to sneak through the forest, he would freeze to death. And surrender was no option for him. Soviet propaganda had told him how the Finns would torture prisoners to death.
So, let's turn our attention to an area known as Ladoga Karelia. Finland didn't expect as much heavy fighting in this area, so only about 30,000 soldiers were positioned there. But the Soviets surprised them with almost 100,000 Red Army troops, artillery, and even air support. It was here, near the small river Kola, a small force of Finnish troops retreated from the advancing Soviet force and took cover on the high ridges overlooking the landscape. The Battle of Kola between the outnumbered Finns and the immense Soviet army lasted the entire duration of the war, achieving a near legendary status among Finnish soldiers. One such man was Arn Jutalainen, also known as the Terror of Morocco. He famously stated that Kola will hold unless the orders are to run. In fact, he once received an order to withdraw, which he ignored because it didn't specifically say run. A master of guerrilla tactics in the snow and ice, his men called him Papa, and during the war he lost a finger on his right hand. But perhaps the most famous soldier from this battle is none other than sniper Simo Haya, also known as the White Death. Simo was born in a small village in southern Finland, where he enjoyed skiing, duck hunting, and farming. After joining the Civil Guard at the age of 17, he began honing his skills as an expert marksman, so successfully that his home was reportedly full of trophies from shooting competitions. During his Civil Guard training, he once shot a target 150 meters away, that's about 500 feet, 16 times in one minute. An accomplishment even more impressive when you consider that his weapon, the M2830, was a bolt-action rifle that only held five rounds in its magazine. A master of stealth, he wore several layers of pure white clothing to blend in with the landscape and was obsessive about his work, making it seem more like an art. He would arrive at one of his favorite sniper spots before dawn and prepare meticulously in the dark to ensure that he would be invisible throughout the day. He would pack snow down where his rifle would rest to minimize powdery snow puffing up when he fired his weapon. He dug a shallow snow pit where he would sit, as he preferred to sit instead of lie prone, while overhanging tree branches would further conceal his position from the enemy. He didn't even use a scope on his sniper rifle. As the bitter cold would fog up the lens, the scope would make him a slightly large target, and he could possibly be spotted by sunlight reflecting off it. But mostly, he simply preferred his iron sights, as he had been training with them all his life. To top it off, he was even known to put snow in his mouth to reduce the visibility of his own breath in the air. All of this camouflage and his incredible aim made him an absolute ghost of a sniper and the Russians feared him. Simo served for around 100 days in the Winter War, during which he is credited with over 500 kills, giving him an average of five every single day and making him the deadliest known sniper in history. His highest count in one day was 25 confirmed kills. He gained a reputation among his fellow soldiers for his wicked accuracy not only with his rifle, but also with his secondary submachine gun if the Soviets got too close. He became a myth in Finnish war propaganda, where he was called the magic shooter. Finnish propaganda further stated that the Soviet soldiers referred to him as the White Death. Simo was the perfect sniper, as he could stay motionless for hours on end, and he knew the forest well. Once he was tasked with taking down a Soviet sniper who had killed several Finnish officers, Simo picked his spot in the snow and didn't move a muscle for hours, scanning the snowy terrain for the slightest movement. As the sun set, the Soviet sniper, assuming the fighting was done for the day, stood up from his concealed position, and the sun reflected off his scope, betraying his location. Simo, like a cobra, didn't hesitate, and only needed a single bullet to kill the Soviet sniper, who was 400 meters away. The Soviet Red Army continued to send several snipers to deal with Simo, but none of them returned. They got so fed up with him that at one point they called in an artillery strike towards his general location as he had been picking off artillerymen throughout the day. During this barrage, one shell landed just a few meters away from him, blowing the snow off his back and incinerating much of his coat. But he emerged with just a cut. Simo's reign as the Grim Reaper came to an end when he was shot in the face with an explosive bullet. Missing most of his jaw sprawled in the snow, he was presumed dead by his unit and was placed in a pile of bodies, when suddenly someone noticed that his leg was twitching. He was immediately rushed off the front lines and into a hospital where he regained consciousness a week later. After reading about his own death in the newspaper, he politely wrote the author a letter, asking him to correct the mistake. He then went through 26 surgeries and recovered from his wounds in just over a year. After the war, he remained a modest man his entire life. In an interview, he famously said, War is not a pleasant experience, but who else would protect this land unless we're willing to do it ourselves? I did what I was told to do as well as I could. There would be no Finland unless everybody else had done the same. And when asked how he became such a skilled marksman, he simply responded, Practice. Simo was given his own farm and was an avid moose hunter and dog breeder for the rest of his days. He died in 2002 at the age of 96. Thank you.
While Simo was holding off an army at Kola, the fighting raged on across the rest of the front. At the Battle of Kainu, an ambush on a Soviet division resulted in a shocking underdog victory where the Finns lost only 400 men compared to Soviet casualties of over 6,000. After the battle, Finnish troops captured much-needed tanks, weapons, ammunition, and medical supplies. While morale stayed high on the Mannerheim line, the Finnish fighting spirit stayed courageous even in the air. The Soviets had an immense air superiority and ran bombing runs daily, but the thick forests made it difficult to bomb Finnish troops hiding among the trees, and there were almost no strategic targets to hit in the cities. They mainly targeted munitions factories and railroads, but these were quickly repaired as soon as the bombers turned around. The Finnish air force itself was small, only numbering 114 planes at the start of the war, but regardless, they were often seen flying straight into Soviet formations that outnumbered them ten to one. Their air bases often consisted of a runway on a frozen lake, some tents, and a telephone to be notified of air raids, a communication line, which was handled by the female organization Lotta Svart. Back in Moscow, Joseph Stalin was furious at the Red Army's failure in the first couple of months of the war. He'd already begun a propaganda campaign to explain away the daily defeats in Finland, with excuses ranging from bad weather, unfamiliar terrain, and, rather hilariously, claiming that a thousand of America's best pilots had been sent to help defend Finland's skies. It was also reported that Finland's Mannerheim line was stronger than France's Maginot line. But in reality, much of the blame was on Stalin himself. Throughout the 1930s, Stalin had gained absolute power in the Soviet Union by executing generals and officers that weren't entirely loyal to him and replacing them with leaders that he knew he could trust, regardless of their experience. This meant that the Red Army was often lacking in experienced commanders who knew how to improvise and properly lead their troops and was instead more like a collection of amateurs who were rushing into ambushes and getting picked off by Simo if they poked their heads out. Stalin reorganized the offensive and sent hundreds of thousands of soldiers to reinforce the front lines as well as hundreds more tanks and artillery. At the beginning of February 1940, the Red Army launched over 300,000 artillery shells at the Finnish front lines in one day and continued bombarding them for weeks on end. This quickly led to exhausted defenses as they had to repair their fortifications every night and then hide in them during the daily bombings. The Soviets had now adapted their strategies as well, putting tanks in smaller groups supported by large numbers of infantry making it much harder for Finnish soldiers to reach the tanks and immobilize them. One by one, Finnish defenses crumbled under the 450,000 Soviet troops now on the front lines, though many battles remained at stalemate. By the end of February of 1940, the Soviet Union finally responded to the peace offers that Finland had sent repeatedly throughout the war, and negotiations began. The Soviet Union feared the swampy mess that the battlefield would turn into come spring, and so they increased pressure on the tiring Finnish forces apathetic to their own increasing casualties. After a couple more weeks of fighting, the Finns, exhausted and starving in the trenches, finally signed the Moscow Peace Treaty, bringing a ceasefire to the region and an end to the war, but ceding large swaths of territory, even having to give up one of Finland's most populated cities, Vyborg, and over 450,000 Finnish civilians were forced to abandon their homes in the area. Overall, the Soviet Union gained more territory from Finland than they'd originally wanted in pre-war negotiations. They set up naval bases and buffered the territory around Leningrad, just as Stalin had wanted. But this was a victory with a hefty price tag. 26,000 Finnish soldiers were killed and 43,000 were injured, but the Soviets had over 150,000 deaths and 200,000 wounded soldiers. Compared to the relatively minor losses on the Finnish side, the Soviets also lost an estimated 300 tanks and up to 500 aircraft, either to the talented Finnish ace pilots or anti-air guns on the ground. On top of this, the war was a complete embarrassment for the Soviet Union. World War II was still in its early stages, so the entire world had its eyes on the Winter War, and Finland was almost unanimously supported on the international stage, even being supplied weapons and aircraft from Sweden, the United States, and Italy, as well as volunteer fighters from Norway and Denmark. Mark. Britain and France were even threatening to intervene shortly if the fighting didn't stop. Perhaps most importantly, the Soviets' disorganized army and massive casualties were key motivators for Germany's confidence in their later invasion of the Soviet Union. Just a year later, Hitler said, We have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. Finland, on the other hand, was praised internationally for its incredible resistance. But the fighting wasn't over. Just a year later, Finland, baited this time by Nazi Germany, would strike back against the great Soviet bear. But, well, that's a topic for another video. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do like it below. Don't forget to subscribe. And thank you for watching.